What makes this episode different to every other episode of Inside Number 9? Is laughter yoga really a thing? And what did and didn't work with this story? Keep watching to find out the answers to these questions and more. Welcome to Square Eyes, a channel where we recap, review and take a sideways look at your favourite TV programmes. This video will look at the second episode of the ninth series of Inside Number 9. It's called The Trolley Problem. Let's jump straight in. The episode opens in a countryside house at night, in the middle of a raging storm, which sets the scene nicely. In the kitchen of the house, Steve Pemberton's character Blake is making a tea for a soaking wet man called Drew, who is sat at the counter. Blake is fussing over Drew, who gives minimal answers to all his questions. As the conversation unfolds, it becomes clear that Blake found the soggy looking Drew, contemplating his life on a nearby bridge, and coaxed him down. This explains the chatter to try and engage him. We then find out that Blake is a therapist, though he studied at an online college, so his qualifications may not be the best. He tries to engage Drew about the problems that led him to the bridge, and finds out that he hasn't sought any help for his issues. As they chat about a practice called laughter yoga, they both start laughing, which prompts Drew to laugh so maniacally that it tips him over into sobbing. Blake goes over to comfort him, rubs him on the back, and as his jumper rides up, it reveals a gun, which adds an extra layer of danger to the encounter. Blake doesn't show any signs that he's seen the gun, and offers Drew a tissue. They continue the conversation, and Drew says that he thinks he might have killed someone. Then he gets very aggressive with Blake when he asks him a question. It's tense, but the moment passes when he asks to use the bathroom, which Blake is happy to agree to so he can get some space. While Drew is in the bathroom, he splashes water on his face and removes a handful of pills from a bottle, and then puts them in his palm. He also looks at himself in the mirror, that suggests he's up to something. Blake is up to something as well, as we see him opening up a capsule and pouring a drug into one of the cups of tea he's making. He quickly stirs it in, just as Drew returns from the bathroom. A conversation about Blake's son's drawing in the bathroom leads Blake to getting some drawing materials out for Drew to use as some form of therapy for him. While he's doing that, Drew drops some of the pills he's palmed into Blake's tea, so now both cups of tea have been drugged. They each drink from their tea and look at the other man, waiting for their trickery to take hold. Blake is the first to feel the effects, as the audio from Drew's speech becomes distorted, as we sense that Blake is drifting out of consciousness. Then we cut to the next scene, and Blake has been zip-tied to the cooker, and he's sat on the kitchen floor. Drew's first question for Blake as he comes around is to ask him why he drugged him, which is a bit rich as they both try to drug each other. Blake explains that he tried to drug Drew because of his unpredictable behaviour, his confession about killing someone, and the fact that he had a gun. Blake counters by asking Drew if he often dopes people who have saved his life, which prompts Drew to reveal that the situation on the bridge was all set up so he could get into Blake's house. He says he'd been watching Blake for a while. Blake tries to work out what Drew's motivation is for being in his house, and it's obviously more than a straightforward robbery. They discuss the trolley problem, a thought experiment about whether it's better to let a runaway train kill five people, or take action to divert the train to a track that would kill only one. The discussion seems abstract, but from the agitation we see in Drew, it obviously means more to him. Drew throws in a potential third solution to the problem, where you could sacrifice yourself to save all six people in the scenario. Then we get closer to the point of Drew's real intentions, when he asks Blake about Ellie Dawson. Blake says he doesn't know who she is, despite Drew telling her that she's a former patient. She had come to Blake with a host of problems, and he had prescribed her some medication, the same he had just been drugged with, and then given her some therapy. Drew plays back a recording of one of their sessions, which makes for grim listening. From the recording we can see that Blake is a terrible therapist. He's clearly abusing his trusted position and takes advantage of a damaged and vulnerable client. He's thoroughly ashamed of himself to hear the session played back. He tells Drew to turn off the recording and confesses that he does remember Ellie. He had treated her first, then been romantically involved with her before eventually taking out a restraining order on her when she'd become obsessed with him. As Blake is talking through Ellie's situation, he realises that Drew is Ellie's father, which makes sense of why he's come to visit him. Ellie's dead now though, and it's obvious that Drew is racked with guilt and regret about the role he played in her death. Blake is insistent that he had no role in Ellie's death, but Drew quickly asks back if he visits her at the hotel room that she was on on the night that she died. Blake had been spotted leaving the hotel shortly before Ellie's body was found, but after she had taken the lethal amount of drugs that killed her. Blake obviously knew that Ellie had taken too much and needed medical help, but left the hotel without raising the alarm, effectively condemning Ellie to death by not taking any action. When Blake says he didn't do anything, he means he didn't kill her, but also by not doing anything, he also didn't stop her from dying as well. Who describes it as the difference between killing someone and letting them die? which is where the trolley problem comes into this scenario, I suppose. Drew pulls out his gun and demands that Blake makes a full confession about what he did with Ellie. He thinks this will be a way for Ellie to rest in peace, and perhaps for him to have some peace on the matter too. Blake agrees and asks for the zip tie to be cut so he can write his confession. Though once he's been freed, he tells Drew that he knows the gun is a spud gun, so isn't a real threat to him, then stabs him in the thigh with his pen. Blake then escapes to his car outside the house, and he's seemingly about to drive off, but instead changes his mind. He gets something out of his boot instead. Back in the house, Drew has pulled out the pen, tied up his leg to staunch the bleeding, and is hobbling around in a panic. Then the lights are cut in the house, and we hear the sound of breaking glass as the storm continues to rage outside. Blake then enters the house and starts knocking things over onto the floor, 
making it look like he's interrupted a burglar to justify what he plans to do to Drew with the tire iron he's got in his hand, so it looks like self-defence. He explained to Drew that he can't have the business with Ellie brought up again, because it will ruin his reputation. Just as Blake is about to bring the tire iron down on Drew, he changes his mind and decides it would be better to take him back to the bridge instead. Many people have walked past him earlier in the evening, so Blake would make it look like Drew had jumped and those witnesses would verify the story. Drew pleads with his life and asks Blake to confess, but he is unrepentant and drags Drew out to the car. Once they're outside, Drew asks Blake to go back to the house to get his coat and also to take a look in the pocket on the right side. Blake finds a phone number in the coat pocket, which he rings and his son picks up. He says he's trapped in a box and can't breathe. Drew has trapped him in there and says Blake will come and get him if he does the right thing. Outside, Drew no longer seems scared. He seems calm and in control. Blake rushes outside to plead with Drew for his son's life, to find out his location so he can save him. But Drew has found a can of petrol and is pouring on himself. Before Blake can stop him, Drew lights himself on fire, which means he won't be able to do anything to help Blake's son. With the reflection of the flames flickering in Blake's glasses, the credits roll on one of the most troubling ends to an episode of Inside Number 9. I didn't love this episode in the same way I loved last week's Boo to a Goose. This one was enjoyable and had elements I liked, but enough little quibbles for it not to be one of my favourites. I liked the dramatic setting, the acting was good and the direction gave it the right sort of feel. Compared to the usual high bar for the series, I think the writing was a little bit undercooked in places, and the references were a little bit forced where they're typically interwoven within the story a lot better, though I only feel able to be critical about episodes because my expectations are very high based on what's come before. After last week's episode provided a glut of guest acting talent, I like that this episode was pretty much a two-hander, with only Reese Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton appearing on screen, supported only by the recorded voice of Ellie and Robbie on the phone. I enjoyed watching both actors going through the gears with their characters. Reese Shearsmith's Drew character starts off a broken man on the brink of doing himself in, then we find out that he's a brief father trying to get justice. The balance of power twists against him and he pleads for his life, only for us to learn that he never really cared for his life anyway and was playing a game all along so he could get a confession out of Blake. Steve Pemberton also showed his range with Blake, as he went from smarmy to sinister, to desperate, to vicious, to psychotic, to even more desperate in the end. Now I'm recapping all the different mood shifts we saw from the two different characters. I can see how I found it a little bit tricky to go along with this story. It felt a bit too much for a 29-minute story to contain so many wild swings and emotion within the two central characters. Had this been a feature-length film, these shifts could have been built up to more steadily, but there just wasn't space for it in this time, and it felt a bit like it was lurching from one thing to another. I think the ending was a very nice visual effect, and while it was quite unsettling to watch, the framing of watching the action unfold to the reflection in Blake's glasses, where you could also get to see Blake's reaction at the same time, was a very nice touch and it was very impactful. I was less keen on some of the story bits that you felt like you had to really stop thinking about too much for it to all work. I really couldn't understand why Blake would have gone back inside to get Drew's coat, apart from the fact they had to in order to get the slip of paper with the phone number on for the dramatic ending. Equally, it was convenient that there was a can of petrol in the boot of Blake's car for Drew to use, and Blake was probably close enough to slap the lighter out of his hand anyway. And regardless of all that, Drew's plan wouldn't have played out in full if Blake had brought down the tire iron as he seemed like he was going to do earlier in the episode, but Drew just let that situation play out. These are only quite minor quibbles, and I've got more that I could list. I think I only notice this sort of thing when a story hasn't fully absorbed me, so that's the bigger problem, really. I'm also not convinced you could say it's a proper trolley problem, as Blake doesn't really know the full details of the choice he's making at the point he makes the decision to kill Drew, as it's only later that he finds out that his son's being trapped. No story ever worked perfectly, and pedantic details like these can be overlooked. I think the reason I raised them is to say that the flow of the story didn't take me long enough to disregard these little details. I'd rate this as a slightly below average Inside Number 9 episode, but it's still better than most things that's on TV at the moment. I enjoyed watching it, I just think it could have been better in a few ways. My favourite line in this episode came when Blake said to Drew, I'm not a big fan of games, and Drew replied, I am, which you could take at face value, as they were talking about the board game Monopoly at the time, but I think he's really talking about mind games which is really what the whole episode is about. Drew has infiltrated Blake's house and is playing a big mind game with him to test whether he'll confess to what he did to Ellie. This episode was directed by Al Campbell, who is better known to many as Barry Shitpeas, as a regular guest on Charlie Brooker's TV programmes. This is the first time in an episode of Inside Number 9 that only Reese Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton have been on the screen together for a whole episode. The Stakeout and Bernie Clifton's dressing room are both close to two-handers, but each do feature a single actor even if only fleetingly. Blake talks to Drew about the bystander effect when they're discussing why so many people walked past him when he was stood on the bridge. I nearly talked about the bystander effect in my last video, as there was a great example of it in the Boo to a Goose episode last week. At one point, Raymond grabs Finn and has him by the neck, but the rest of the passengers sit and watch. Nobody steps in to do anything. With the bystander effect, the more observers there are to something, the less likely it is that someone will take action, because everyone thinks someone else will step up. Or so the theory goes. I thought the thing that Blake was saying about laughter yoga might be made up, but it is all real. 
It's a proper type of therapy that people actually do, and it really was invented in the 90s by a man called Madden Kataria, who still practices it today. He's very successful from it too. An article in The Guardian from 2022 said that there are laughter yoga clubs in 116 countries, and Kataria has been given a genius visa in the United States and addressed the Senate committee there in 2010. It sounds like absolute quackery to me, but he seems to be doing well off it, so fair play to him. More pseudo-medical flim-flam came up in the episode in the shape of the Snodzy test, which Drew notices and Blake tells him is a discredited psychological test, where you choose who you'd least like to be stuck in an elevator with, and it reveals something about you. The faces are on the screen now if you want to have a go yourself. I'll put a link in the show notes to an article where you can look at the answers for each picture if you'd like. I pick number seven, the maniac, as the person I'd least like to spend time in the lift with, in case you were interested. The hidden hair in this episode was quite tricky to find, but if you look on the kitchen windowsill, as Drew is pointing his gun at Blake, you can see it just on the counter in the background. The next episode of Inside Number 9 is called Mulberry Close, and here's the post that's been released to promote it. It looks like it's been shot from the perspective of a doorbell camera, and given the post replicates the old-style neighbourhood watch logo, I suspect interfering neighbours will be a theme of the episode too. Should be a fun one. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back soon with my recap and review for the next episode. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to make sure you don't miss the next one. It helps me to grow the channel, and lets me know that the people watching these videos want me to make more. Goodbye.